At the last podcast, you learned how you can calculate the change in heat involved when an object either warms up or cools off. No phase change was involved. That was summarized with the equation, the change in heat, or Q, is equal to the mass of an object times its specific heat times its change in temperature. This next section will talk about some general thermochemical terms and then we'll focus actually on the chemical heat changes that take place when a reaction actually occurs. So first some definitions. By the way, you're going to have a 10 question true-false quiz that will come after you view this vodcast. Make sure you have your PowerPoint notes handy. Make sure you write down all of the information for which blanks have been provided and if and I was you, I would make sure I add some of the subtle notes that Ms. Doe identifies as we go through the vodcast. And the reason is you'll be attending college, hopefully, within a few months if you're a senior or a year and a few months if you're a junior. And part of surviving college is knowing how to take good notes. So let's keep up that practice. Thermochemistry is the study of heat changes that accompany chemical reactions and also some phase changes. We'll deal with phase changes in another podcast. So what we call the system is that part of the universe that you're focusing on at just that moment in time. It could be, say, a reaction that's happening inside a beaker. It doesn't include the beaker. It's what's happening inside the beaker with the chemical reaction that's taking place. Everything else, other than those chemicals reacting, is called the surroundings. So that would include the beaker itself, the air around the beaker, the table underneath the beaker, and so on. So in a very limited definition of what is the universe, we can define the universe as any system that's under study plus its surroundings. And here it is summarized with a simple uh, equation. Now, some of these reactions that we've been doing this past year have been spontaneous. And what that means is that it's a reaction that just goes. It happens under the conditions that have been specified. The word spontaneous doesn't mean fast. It just means it happens. And when we look at our types of reactions that we've been studying this year, we learned about endo and exothermic. If the universe had to choose between its favorite type of reaction, it would probably pick exothermic. Because as you know, an exothermic reaction results in a net release of energy. In this case, heat energy is released to the surroundings and it feels hot. When that happens, that system goes to a lower energy state. And that's how the universe likes to chill. It likes to favor reactions that make the, all the substances in the reaction at a lower energy state. It would be equivalent to me trying to stand on one foot, high energy state, but when I get to put my foot down, I go, ha, I'm at a lower energy state. So exothermic reactions are often very likely to occur, but enthalpy, a fancy word for heat, is different than entropy, which is a word for disorder. And we will talk about entropy, the degree of disorder, that also is a driver of reactions in a later podcast. So enthalpy, where the T-H-A-L-P-Y, is defined as the total energy content, I like to call it heat content, of a system. And it can be symbolized with the letter H. Now you're probably going, what the heck, Miss Doe, you just taught me Q equals MC delta T and Q stood for heat. If you want to learn the difference between Q and H, take AP Chemistry, but just trust me, when you write the symbol H, it stands for heat under constant pressure. And 99.99% of everything that we do with heat changes is in a situation where the pressure isn't changing. So we're going to use the symbol H to stand for heat now. That's going to make more sense. And the only way you can figure out what the change in enthalpy is, is if you can compare the substances both before and after that chemical or physical change. We'll focus on chemical for right now. So for most physical and chemical changes, you simply find the difference between the heat content of the reactants and the heat content of the products. So we refer to that 
gain or net loss or net gain of heat as delta H, change in enthalpy or heat. And of course you know that you can put a positive or a negative sign in front of the delta H. Negative sign, exothermic, positive, endothermic. Well, to be more specific, there's lots of changes in heat, many different kinds. We've already looked at the heat of solution when we conducted our little mini molarity lab and felt that some substances just simply dissolving can get hotter or colder. But we're going to focus on delta H with a little RxN, the abbreviation for reaction. And the heat of a reaction is the energy absorbed or released during a chemical change and it says as measured by a calorimeter. Now that would be a calorimeter different than what we've been using. That's a specific bomb calorimeter. So notice that you can find the change in heat if you take the sum of the heat of the products. That's that symbol sigma, which you may have seen in, a, in another math class. And it means you're going to have to go look at the products produced find their individual heats from a table and add them all up. You'll do the same thing for the heat of the reactants and when you subtract them you will know by either a negative sign net release of energy or a positive sign absorption of energy if your reaction was exo or endothermic. So having said that let's take a look at an example. This is a thermochemical, well, yeah, sort of. This is one way to express heat in an equation. Notice on example E, we're going to burn this hydrocarbon, C6H12O6, in oxygen, and of course, sadly for planet Earth, that yields CO2 and water. So it's a balanced equation, and nice people without a social life have figured out that the change in that was a negative 2,870 kilojoules. Well, that makes sense. You burn something, it gives off heat. Now, if you carefully study the reaction shown in F, you'll see that it's the same exact equation except written backwards. So notice that off to the side of the equation, we've written the same number, 2,870 kilojoules, but we've changed the sign. If a reaction is exothermic, going from left to right, what we call the forward direction, if you write it backwards, then the sign must also change. So one of the ways in a thermochemical equation that you can show the heat change is separately, off to the side, indicate that the delta H is a certain value with a plus or a minus sign. We'll learn how to calculate that pretty much now. A thermochemical equation that includes the quantity of heat released or absorbed in the equation is shown here. Now with some boo-boos on our subscripts there, it should be the same reaction. Notice the difference now. When you see this first top reaction, notice how it doesn't say delta H equals 2870. It shows that the heat was a product given off as that hydrocarbon burned. If you look at the bottom example, now notice that when you write the equation backwards, CO2 and water will require this much heat, written as if it was a reactant on the left side of the arrow, to produce that same hydrocarbon and some oxygen gas. So on a separate worksheet, which we will do when we meet up next, you will have a chance to practice ways of expressing heat. It can be set off to the side as a delta H, or it can be included in the equation. Endothermic reactions, like the bottom example, write the heat in on the left. Exothermic, write it as a product on the right. Notice that there is no delta H symbol in this way of expressing the heat change. Now there's all kinds of heat, like I said, so here's another one. It's kind of a funny looking symbol, but it stands for the heat of formation. And the little funny degree looking symbol here just means it's taking place under what chemists like to call standard conditions. Most of the time that's at 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere of pressure. So the heat of formation refers to the heat that is either released or absorbed when one mole of a compound is formed by combining its parent elements. 
So for example, if you add hydrogen and burn it in oxygen, you'll form the compound water. And people, again, without the social lives, have calculated the heat of formation for water in its various forms. So at standard conditions, that's the delta H, or change in enthalpy or heat, of the formation of one mole of a compound from its parent elements. Now you're going to see something kind of interesting on the next table. The elements are defined, all elements are defined as having a zero heat of formation. I know that doesn't make sense, but let's think about that. From whenever you define the universe to have become, the elements have existed. We as puny humans cannot make elements in a chemical reaction. So by definition, the heat of formation of elements in what we call their standard states, their chill state, their more relaxed lowest energy state, again an AP concept, all of their heats of formation are going to be zero. So it makes the math really simple when we get doing some problems here in just a moment. If you have a negative heat of formation, though, as a compound, that's telling you that, hey, when those two guys or three or four parent elements got together, they made a compound that was at lower energy than the parents. And the universe likes to drive that way. That's telling you that the compound that formed was more stable than the elements that made it up. Here is a lovely table of some heats of formation at 25 degrees Celsius. So let's look to see if we have any elements on here. No, we do not. Bummer. We need to put in a table that shows that. All of these substances are compounds. Notice that their heat of formation is expressed in kilojoules per mole. So for example, to form one mole of acetylene, you would need 226.7 kilojoules. But when one mole of ammonia forms, you get a net release, that's what the negative sign means, of 46.1 kilojoules for every mole of ammonia that forms. So they can be positive or negative. Also notice that the heats of formation can be different. If you have a compound like water, in its gas phase, <coughs> it has a release of 241.8 kilojoules. But if you're making liquid water, it releases a little bit more per mole of liquid water. Be careful with that when we do something called Hess's Law in a few days. Just saying. So here is a way to calculate the change in heat under standard conditions for this particular reaction that you see here. I'm going to need to find the heat by summing up the heat of formation of the products. We always go backwards in chemistry. Here's my product minus the sum of the heat of the reactants. Ah, but wait, there's an element in there. Remember, elements don't have a heat of formation. So it's going to make our math really simple. Remember though, it's always backwards seeming, products minus reactants. So where did that 52.3 number come from right here? It came from a table like on the previous slide, and that's the heat of formation for C2H4. You subtract the sum of the heat of the two reactants, well the zero is the element hydrogen. Elements have zero heat of formation, but the heat of formation of C2H2 is this value here. So overall, the change in heat for this reaction of combining C2H2 and hydrogen to yield C2H4 is an exothermic reaction, negative 174.4 kilojoules you would always be given a table. Notice also that when you have coefficients in the balanced equation, you're going to have to multiply the heat of reaction, such as in this carbon monoxide or the carbon dioxide. But once again, I've got an element, they have zero heat of formation. So I'm going to go 2 times the heat of formation of CO2 it's always products, and that's where the negative 393.5 came from, from a table. But we had to multiply it by 2. We subtract the sum of the heat of the reactants. Well, there are two moles of carbon monoxide. This is the heat of formation for carbon monoxide, plus, I don't even have to worry about the oxygen, I'm just showing you right now, its heat of formation is zero because it's an element in its most standard state. 
So when you take a number and you're subtracting a negative, that's the same as adding a positive, and the overall change in enthalpy or heat for this reaction is negative 566 kilojoules. Now I hope you did a good job of taking notes because now, while it's still fresh in your brain, or maybe in a few minutes after you re review your notes, have your PowerPoint notes handy that you've just written on, go back to Moodle, and please open the quiz for Chapter 16, Vodcast Number 2. You will only have until Friday at 10 o'clock in the morning to complete and submit this quiz. After that, except for absentees, I'll be closing. Okay, until next time.